Hi, I'm Pastor Cheryl Pickford. Thank you for joining me today for this message titled, Can I Get a Witness? You know, when someone is called upon to testify in a court of law, they're instructed to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. No embellishments or opinions are allowed. It's just the facts, and only the facts that they observe. Sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? We, however, tend to get all tongue-tied and frustrated when we think about being a witness for Jesus, which is simply sharing our testimony with non-believers. After all, we weren't eyewitnesses to Jesus' life on earth, but we are faith witnesses and personally know how our life has changed because of Christ. So in today's message, I'll be addressing Jesus' expectation that we will all share our testimony of him with others, the support that we receive from our Savior, and offer some practical steps on how we can overcome our jitters about sharing our testimony. Before we get launched into this message, please join me in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you. Thank you for this message. Thank you for your great commission. Thank you that we get to participate in building your kingdom and doing your work. Lord, I pray that this message would impact people's lives and impact your kingdom for eternity. Make us bold witnesses, Lord. Help us use the tools that you have given us and step out in faith knowing that you are with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Our text today is Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, and I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. Jesus came up and said to his disciples, All authority, all power of absolute rule in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Help the people to learn of me, believe in me, and obey my words. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance, and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. Well, telling others about Jesus is a command from God. Our witness is based on the authority of Jesus Christ. Look at Matthew 28, 18 from the NIV version. Then Jesus came to the disciples and said, All authority in heaven and earth have been, has been given to me. Therefore go, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. We are promised by Jesus the authority and power to proclaim the gospel throughout the entire world. God gave Jesus the authority over heaven and earth. And on the basis of that authority, Jesus told his disciples to make more disciples as they preached, baptized, and taught. Well, with this same authority, Jesus still commands us to tell others the good news and make disciples for the kingdom. This is the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 19, in the voice, from the voice translation reads, Go out, make disciples in all the nations, ceremonially wash them through baptism in the name of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then disciple them, form them in the practices and postures that I have taught you, and show them how to follow the commands I have laid down for you. Three easy steps, right? Make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teach them all things that Jesus has taught you. <laughs> we fall apart at step one. Make disciples? Oh, that means I need to talk to someone. Yep. You know, we're compelled to witness 
When someone's leaving us or dying, his or her last words are very important. Promising them that he would always be with them. Jesus left the disciples with our final marching orders. In previous missions, Jesus sent his disciples only to the Jews. But their mission from now on would be worldwide. Jesus is Lord of the earth, and he died for the sins of people from all nations. Therefore, we're to go, whether it's next door or to another country. We are commanded to go and make disciples. This is not an option. It's a command to all who call Jesus Lord. Now, we may not be evangelists in the formal sense, but you know, we've all received gifts that we can use to help fulfill the Great Commission. As we obey, we have comfort in the knowledge that Jesus is always with us. The Bible tells us the account of lepers who came upon a deserted enemy camp, filled themselves with food, and realized that their lives had been spared. At first, they kept the good news to themselves, forgetting that their fellow citizens were starving in the city. 2 Kings chapter 7, verse 9. I'm reading from the Amplified Version. Then they said one to another, We're not doing the right thing. This is a day of good news, yet we're keeping silent. If we wait until the morning light, some punishment for not reporting this now will come upon us. So now come, let us go and tell the king's household. If we have experienced the good news of Jesus Christ, we will not be able to keep it to ourselves. The good news about Jesus Christ must be shared. No news is more important. We must not forget those who are dying without it. We must not become so preoccupied with our own faith that we neglect sharing it with those around us. Our wonderful news, like that of the lepers, will not wait till morning. You know, Christ could return for his church at any moment. And we want to be busy about the Father's business, which is our great commission. But sadly, in too many churches, the Great Commission could be called the Great Omission. They're no longer concerned about saving the lost. They get stirred up about silly things like the color of the carpet, or if someone moved the organ on the platform. And the Great Commission is largely ignored. We don't want our faith walk to become stagnant and inwardly focused. People are dying and going to hell both evil people and nice people. If they have not made Jesus Christ their Lord and Savior, hell is their destiny. You know, God has graciously given us free choice, but we cannot control the consequences of our decisions. That belongs to God. The Bible is very clear about this. The only way to a right relationship with God is through the trust and belief in Jesus Christ. And how can they find and trust in Jesus if no one tells them about him? Look at Jonah, chapter 3, verses 4 through 5. And I'm reading from the New International Version. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. Well, the Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. Our responsibility here is to witness. We can't determine who will respond. God's word is for everyone. And despite the wickedness of the Ninevite people, they were open to God's message and repented immediately. If we simply proclaim what we know about God, we may be surprised at how many people will listen. In Jonah's case, the witnessing was done grudgingly, but it was still effective. We cannot predict who will respond. We should never prevent someone from, come, from having the opportunity. You know, I heard a pastor once say that a person must hear the gospel seven times before it will finally sink in. 
I don't know if this is accurate or not, but I heard the gospel message many times before it finally clicked for me. I cemented my faith in Christ one stormy night in Delaware in my living room while watching the 700 Club. When Ben Kinchlow gave the invitation, all of the pieces finally fell into place, and I committed my life to Jesus. Now, I'd been a faithful church attender, but I had never taken the step to commit my life to Jesus before that moment. My life has never been the same. God gave me an insatiable hunger for his word, called me into ministry, and not only opened doors for me to study, but paid for my classes as well. And then he brought me on staff of several different churches where I have been able to use my gifts and talents for building his kingdom. My life has an eternal purpose now, and I strive to impact this world for God's glory. What is your salvation experience? Just as all of our fingerprints are different from other people's, our salvation experience is different from others as well. God is a personal God. And our salvation experiences are unique and personal. Now, we've seen that telling others about Jesus is a command from God and that we're compelled to witness. Now we will look at some practical steps to overcome those jitters about sharing our testimony about what Jesus has done in our life. Have you ever heard of an elevator speech? An elevator speech is a short description of the point that you want to make, presented in the time it takes an elevator to go from the top floor to the first floor, or vice versa. It's prepared and memorized ahead of time and will grab people's attention in a way that makes them want to know more instead of putting them off. See, we often think we're not qualified to talk to people about Jesus. Don't allow that feeling to prevent you from sharing about our Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 in the NIV says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. We should always be ready to give an answer for the hope that lives within us. Don't beat them over the head with the Bible. Just gently and respectfully share about the difference that Jesus has made in your life. Be a witness. And instead of making a defense of your faith, simply share your story on how you came to put your faith in Jesus and the difference that that decision has made in your life. Your personal testimony is one of the most effective methods you have for telling others about Jesus. Share your story on how you came to put your faith in Christ and the difference that decision has made in your life. Your testimony can be divided into three parts. Part one is life before accepting Christ. Part two is how you accepted Christ. And part three is how your life is different now. Simple, right? Well, for example, before Jesus, I was open to many things that are clearly demonic. I didn't know or understand that these things were bad. I grew up playing with occult things in my childhood home, and it all just seemed very normal to me. It was a big surprise when I began learning about how God wants me to live and realized that I was dabbling in demonic darkness. I was also a feminist, and God very quickly brought to my attention the fact that I was not treating my husband with respect. My marriage is much better now, that I have, now that I have Jesus and have tried to live in a way that honors God. Oh, and here's an interesting little nugget. Before Jesus, I was terrified of thunderstorms. I mean, absolutely petrified of them. Something that, it, that dates back to my early childhood and continued until my conversion. But now, after becoming a Christian, <laughs> I love thunderstorms. 
especially thunderstorms at night. I'm always disappointed if I sleep through one and often try to wake myself up so I can enjoy them. Well, as you prepare your own elevator speech, think about, you know, what, what are some of the unmet needs that, that you had in your life before Jesus? I mean, it might be a lack of significance or maybe a lack of purpose, a feeling of emptiness, uh, fear of death, lack of peace, or any number of things. How did you try to meet those needs? Some possibility might include accomplishments, accumulation of wealth or things, drugs, alcohol, sex, or perhaps finding your identity through work, education, or athletics. Next, talk about the circumstances and events that caused you to consider Christ and the steps that you took to become a Christian. Include a brief but clear presentation of the gospel here. And finally, how has your life changed since you became a Christian? This should relate back to the specific issues that you discussed in the Life Before Jesus section. Keep it concise. Begin with an attention-getting sentence. Be positive from start to finish. Emphasize the difference that Jesus has made in your life. You might even consider using one scripture in your testimony. But be careful not to use churchy words. You know, Christianity has its own vocabulary. As a new believer, I often found myself writing these unfamiliar words down and looking them up after I got home. Let's put the cookies on the bottom shelf. Make it easier for an unchurched person to understand what you are talking about. For example, instead of using the words born again, use words like spiritual birth, spiritual renewal, to come alive spiritually or given a new life. And instead of saying saved, it's another churchy word, use rescued, delivered from despair, or found hope in life. Instead of lost, you might say headed in the wrong direction, separated from God, or have had no hope. Now, we all know what the gospel message is, but odds are our audience doesn't. They hear the word gospel and they probably think it's a style of music, like Southern gospel. So instead of using the word gospel, I suggest you use God's message to man, or the good news about Jesus Christ's purpose on earth. Instead of sin, I suggest you try using rejecting God, missing the mark, falling away from the right path, or disobedience to God. Repent is another churchy word that many just don't understand. Instead of using repent, try using admit a wrong. Change one's heart, mind, or attitude. Make a decision to turn away or turn around, or making a 180 degree turn from where you were. Finally, don't get preachy. And don't give the impression that the Christian life is without problems. We all have trouble in this world, whether we're Christians or not. But trouble is not insurmountable when we have Jesus. I suggest you write out and memorize your testimony. Practice it till it sounds natural. Rehearse it with a friend and relax. Smile, be friendly. Remember, it's not your job to convert someone. Your job is to tell them about what Jesus has done for you. Be a witness. So we've seen that telling others about Jesus is a command from God and that we're compelled to witness. And we've looked at some practical steps to help us overcome the jitters about sharing our testimony, telling others what Jesus has done in our life. You know, Christians today may not be eyewitnesses, but we are faith witnesses to Christ's power in our life. Luke says that the disciples were eyewitnesses to all that had happened to Jesus, his life before his crucifixion and suffering, 
and the forty days after his resurrection, when he taught them more about the kingdom of God. Today there are still people who doubt Jesus' resurrection. But Jesus appeared to the disciples on many occasions after his resurrection, proving that he was alive. And just look at the change that the resurrection made in the disciples' lives. At Jesus' death, they scattered. They were disillusioned and they feared for their life. But after seeing the resurrected Christ, they were fearless and risked everything to spread the good news about him around the world. They faced imprisonment, beatings, rejection, and martyrdom. Yet they never compromised their mission. These men would not have risked their life for something they knew as a fraud. They knew Jesus was raised from the dead, and the early church was fired with their enthusiasm to tell others. It's important to know this, so that we can have confidence in their testimony. Twenty centuries later, we can still be confident that our faith is based on fact. Look at Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with you always, remaining with you perpetually, regardless of circumstance and on every occasion, even to the end of the age. My friends, I urge you to fulfill the Great Commission. Spend some time preparing your testimony and ask God for opportunities to use it. He will provide. And you, you'll discover so much joy as you step out in obedience to God's command. You don't have to be nervous or afraid because Jesus promises that he will be with us even to the end of the age. Thank you, my friends, for joining me today. And I pray that God will bless you abundantly until we meet again.